Hi everyone, my name is Tara Schmidlin, and I'm a genetic counselor at the Coriel Institute for Medical Research. Today I'm going to discuss two cancer risk counseling cases from the Coriel Personalized Medicine Collaborative. The Coriel Personalized Medicine Collaborative, launched in 2007, is a forward-looking, evidence-based research study bridging science and medicine. The CPMC seeks to gain a better understanding of the potential uses of genetic, family history, environment, and lifestyle information to improve health outcomes. The CPMC study has three primary cohorts. The community cohort consists of participants 18 years of age or older with valid emails and no other exclusion or inclusion criteria. Participants were primarily recruited from the Delaware Valley area through local hospitals, Cooper University, and Virtua. The cancer cohort consists of participants with a diagnosis or history of breast or prostate cancer these individuals have been recruited through Fox Chase Cancer Center and Cooper University. The chronic disease cohort includes participants enrolled at The Ohio State University who have either congestive heart failure or hypertension. The CPMC risk reporting approach is unique for the following reasons. We present what is known in the literature. We do not apply additional assumptions to come up with absolute risks of questionable meaning and we report genetic, lifestyle, and family history risks whenever possible. We chose to report risk using relative risks for the following reasons. It allows us to present risks consistently for both genetic and non-genetic factors since relative effects are more commonly reported in published papers. Relative risks are generally more comparable across different populations, and relative risks are ratios of risks or probabilities and are easier to interpret than ratios of odds. We also use relative risk because this allows us to meet our objective of not reanalyzing or making excessive assumptions, since there are very few prospective studies reporting absolute risks due to both genetic and non-genetic factors. For SNP selection, our study design hierarchy and study quality, quality criteria shown on this slide were developed with input for current, from current publication, published recommendations. There is one exception to the study design hierarchy. If there is one prospective study, such as Framingham, that presents both genetic and non-genetic risks from one model, it would trump any meta-analysis of prospective studies. The CPMC study uses an outside advisory board called the Informed Cohort Oversight Board. This board is composed of scientists, medical professionals, and ethicists and community members. The ICOB votes on the validity of proposed genetic variant and disease associations and whether conditions are potentially actionable. Only genetic variants and diseases approved by the ICOB may be reported back to participants. To date, the ICOB has approved the listed complex diseases and drug gene pairs. The eight health conditions highlighted in white are those for which CPMC participants have already received results. Highlighted in red are the two cancer reports we have released. The CYP2C19 and Plavix report is the first drug gene pair result that we have provided to our participants. Now that we've talked about the study structure and advisory groups, I will review the study participation process. Every participant in the CPMC has gone through an informed consent process, which requires them to be 18 years of older, attend an in-person consent presentation, sign a consent form, and have an email address and internet access. Once a participant is enrolled, they are sent an account activation email and are asked to complete a series of health questionnaires, including medical, family, and lifestyle history information, a basic genetic knowledge assessment, and baseline risk perception surveys. The medical, family, and lifestyle questionnaires must be completed prior to their sample being queued for analysis in the lab. Participants can complete the questionnaires gradually over time. Once all required questionnaires are complete, the participant DNA is isolated from the cells in their saliva. The DNA is then processed in our CLIA certified laboratory. We use two different gene chips to analyze the participant's sample. The Affymetrix 6.0 gene chip, which looks at 2 million sites of variation and the DMET chip, which looks at 2,000 sites of known relevance to drug metabolism. Typically, 8 to 10 weeks after a participant completes their questionnaires, their sample has been processed and results are available. Participants are notified of available results via email. 
All participants receive a result for a given condition or gene drug pair, regardless of whether or not they are at increased risk. All results provided to participants are considered to be, at minimum, potentially actionable, meaning that there is some intervention or risk-reducing behavior available to the participant to mitigate risk. Behavior changes we are thinking of include things like diet, exercise, or changing the dose of a drug. Three months after a participant has viewed a result report, they are asked to complete follow-up questionnaires to determine if they discussed the result with their doctor or family members, if they changed any health-related behaviors, or if they began disease screening or did nothing. The CPMC provides a variety of educational resources for both participants and healthcare providers via written education pages and corresponding educational videos for each health condition or drug gene pair on our website, cpmc.coriel.org. We also provide some general background genetic education pages for both lay public and health professional audiences. This is a screenshot of our melanoma educational page and anticipatory guidance video. In the My Account screen, participants can click on the View My Result button next to the report they wish to view. You will notice that participants can request an appointment via the link on the lower left-hand side of the page. This link takes them to a page where they can request an appointment with either a CPMC genetic counselor or volunteer pharmacist. Genetic counselors triage participant requests to determine which questions need to be fielded by a pharmacist. To give you an idea of how frequently counseling requests are made, during the time period from April 2009 when the first result was released through April 2011, we had 418 participant inquiries. This is out of 2,600 eligible participants. These are participants who had results to view, which means only about 11% have contacted a genetic counselor. The majority that are contacting us are using the web portal request an appointment feature However, participants are also able to email us a question via cpmcgc at coriel.org. The vast majority of participant questions were able to be answered via email, followed by phone consultation for more involved discussions, with a very small minority coming to Coriel for in-person counseling. As I mentioned, I will review two cases, one involving results for the RS1690197979 SNP and prostate cancer, and one involving the RS910873 SNP and melanoma. Case 1 is a 23-year-old Eastern European Caucasian male with a non-science graduate degree. He reports regular exercise that he has never smoked and that he drinks about four drinks per day, three to four days per week. Case 1 reports no significant medical history or medications. His mother had breast cancer diagnosed in her early 50s, a maternal grandfather had prostate cancer in his 70s, and a maternal aunt had breast cancer diagnosed in her early 60s. Case 1 presented with the following questions via email. According to my CPMC genetic profile, I am at higher risk for prostate cancer due to my variant 1 in RS1690197979. Thinking of getting my DNA analyzed for the BRCA gene mutations. If I'm positive for the BRCA2 mutation, how much would that increase my overall prostate cancer risk? How would my already known genetic mutations alter the standard prostate cancer screening regimen? And how would a possible BRCA2 mutation further alter it? I am concerned that a possible BRCA2 mutation coupled with my already known RS1690197979 mutation would raise my prostate cancer risk to a high enough level to reasonably expect it at some time in the future. This is a screenshot of Case 1's prostate cancer result for RS1690197979. He has one copy of the risk variant, A and one copy of the non-risk variant C. About six in 100 individuals in the Caucasian population would have a similar result. This variant is not found within a known gene, but is located at 8Q24.21.
Based on his genetic risk result, Case 1 has a relative risk of 1.5 to develop prostate cancer. This means he is 50% more likely than someone with no copies of the risk variant to develop prostate cancer. In counseling, we discussed the following. We discussed his 50% risk to inherit his mother's BRCA2 mutation, and that if he did inherit his mutation, he would have a five to seven fold increased risk for prostate cancer due to the BRCA2 mutation. Explain that his risk is due to this, his risk due to the single SNP that we tested for is 1.5 or 50% more likely than someone without any risk variance. This led to a discussion of the concept of penetrance and the difference between high penetrance genes like BRCA2 and low penetrance genes like the SNPs that we look at in the CPMC study. I explained that we cannot accurately combine the risk numbers for the BRCA2 and the SNP that we tested for because we do not know if we should add them, multiply them, etc. because we do not know how these two variants are interacting. Case 1 did not have any medical information on his father, so he was not provided a family history risk estimate. However, men with a family history of prostate cancer, either a father or brother, have a relative risk of 1.9, or they're 90% more likely to develop prostate cancer than men without a family history. You may recall that Case 1 did report a family history of prostate cancer in a grandfather. However, the CPMC study only provides risk due to affected first-degree relatives, in this case a father or a brother. I explained that his highest, the highest his family history relative risk could be would be 1.9 if he did learn that his father had had prostate cancer. We briefly discussed environmental risk factors for prostate cancer, namely avoiding a high fat diet and obesity. We also discussed concerns that if he ended up with both the BRCA2 mutation and the risk variant for the SNP we tested him for, that he would, def he would, that he would definitely develop prostate cancer. I think he was relieved to learn that that's not the case. Finally, I provided him with a referral for genetic, cancer genetic counseling and a description of what to expect from a cancer counseling session. This should he choose to pursue BRCA2 mutation testing. We briefly discussed the pros and cons and the familial considerations of BRCA2 testing. At this point, he hadn't thought about the fact that knowing or not knowing about BRCA2 might re-enter his mind once he has children whom he might be able to he might have passed the mutation on to. Okay, now I'm going to move on and discuss case two. Case two is a 48-year-old Northern European Caucasian female with some college experience. She reports an occupation in healthcare support. Case two exercises regularly and is a non-smoker and does not drink alcohol. Case two reports a history of high cholesterol, colon polyps, eczema, and depression. She's taking Wellbutrin and naproxen sodium. Her family history was significant for a mother with colon cancer in her 70s, but not for any other family history of cancer. During counseling, we asked Case 2 if there was anything in her CPMC results that surprised her. She replied, melanoma, I guess. Well, no, melanoma wasn't really a surprise because my family is so fair-skinned and my mom has had some skin cancers removed, but it was a different type. It was like squamous cell as opposed to the melanoma. I was a little surprised, a little scared, you know, a little startled that I had the melanoma gene. The melanoma gene comment became a teachable moment, and we discussed that there is not a single gene playing a role in sporadic melanomas, but rather there are likely to be several. We also discussed the large contribution of environmental factors like sun exposure. This is a screenshot of Case 2's melanoma variant report for the RS910873 SNP. She had one copy of the risk variant T and one copy of the non-risk variant C. About 16 in 100 in the Caucasian population would be expected to have the same result. The RS910873 SNP is in the PIGU gene and is thought to be involved in cell cycle regulation. The PIGU gene is at chromosome 20q11.22. Based on case 2's result for this SNP, a relative risk of 1.7, she 
she is 70% more likely than someone without a risk variant to develop melanoma. After explaining her relative risk of 1.7, we discuss the difference between low penetrance genes like PIGU and higher penetrance genes associated with melanoma like P16. I explained that the CPMC study is only looking at the lower penetrance genes for common health diseases. We also discussed the inability to combine risk numbers into a composite risk score, and we spent some time talking about the concept of heritability, since it is estimated that non-genetic factors like sun exposure account for about 79% of the risk of melanoma. This is a screenshot of how we display the concept of heritability to our study participants. Case 2 had no family history of melanoma, but did have a family history of other types of skin cancers. I explained that our risk report only comments on family history of risk of melanoma and does not include other skin cancers. Case 2's mother had squamous cell and not melanoma, so there was no increase in relative risk due to family history. However, if she were to have a, a first degree relative with melanoma, her relative risk would be 2.2. We discussed environmental risks like midday sun exposure, tanning, not using sunscreen or wearing protective clothing, and I also reminded her to check her medications to see if they are sun sensitizing. A recommendation for an annual skin exam with a dermatologist was made, given her risk report result and her family history of other skin cancers. In follow-up with case two, we learned that she had made a dermatology appointment and had a non-concerning mole removed from her back. This mole turned out to be a stage zero melanoma. Case two returned for wide excision of the surrounding area and is now cancer free. Case two reports that she now uses sunblock regularly, even in the winter, and also carries an umbrella for additional sun protection. Case two is a great example of how single SNP results, while not likely to be clinically relevant, are still potentially very actionable in that they can motivate positive health behaviors which lead to early identification of disease and better health outcomes. I would like to thank you all for listening to this presentation and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person. If there are any questions, my email address will be posted. Please feel free to contact me. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the CPMC team, our funding sources, and of course all of the participants of the CPMC. Thank you.